So my daughter Elizabeth, when she was in elementary school, she had a teacher, and the teacher was very white, and uh, the teacher said that when she was a child, uh, she lived in a neighborhood, and in the neighborhood there were some children who were uh, of darker hue. They were black. So uh, she wanted to play with those children, but she was not allowed to play with those children. And why do you think that is? Because she was white, they were black, that wasn't the issue at all. The issue was that she was Jewish. And the black uh, family would not let their children play with somebody who was Jewish. It had nothing to do with color. It had everything to do with religion. And, and you think about, as long as there have been people, there have been divisions. As long as you have uh, nations and, and you have uh, more than one other person, you're going to have prejudice. Uh, it's just part of life. It's part of the way we are. We see things differently. Anybody who's been married more than a week will understand that you don't always see eye to eye. Now, I say that on the basis that yesterday was my wife and my 39th wedding anniversary. And, and I will tell you, yeah, pretty cool, huh? And, and I will tell you, man, we got along great for about a week. You know, and then you know how it goes. Stuff, stuff happens. You don't see eye to eye. And those things take place. And that's the way it is because we are people. But I will tell you, government cannot uh, make edicts that people will get along. Families cannot make their children like each other. Uh, we try, don't we? But you can't do it. And, and the only person, the only way that people can be truly united is through Jesus Christ. And that's what you find in Scripture. Uh, and as the Bible talks about the unity that comes through Jesus, that's what we want to talk about over the next couple of weeks. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. And we're beginning a new series. Uh, the one who brings true unity and just looking at the day in which we live and the divisions that we see, we need to be reminded as a church that there's only one who can bring true unity. The Ephesians chapter 2, if you're using a seat Bible, if you have one, if you picked one up, it's page 151 in the second part of the seat Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, and I will tell you, I will be in Ephesians 2 both this week and next. And as you're turning there, I invite you to find the outline as well. I will tell you that in the age of COVID, uh, you no longer have to fill in blanks. Uh, which for me as a minister is good because I never have anybody at the end of the service say, what was the blank on point number three? You know, sometimes I did forget that, so that doesn't happen anymore. But when you get to Ephesians, understand, uh, the church at Ephesus was a rather well-established church to the point where you had second-generation Christians as part of this church. Now, most of the, the Christians at Ephesus were Gentiles. And so what happened is that some of these people forgot uh, where they came from. One, that they were lost, you know, that was a given. But two, uh, just a division that existed between Jew and Gentile. And so Paul, in these verses, wants to remind the Gentile believers of the unity that came about and what the result was from that. So if you're in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we're going to begin with verse 11. We're just going to hang here just for a minute and go somewhere else. But let me begin with verse 11, Ephesians chapter 2. And Paul says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity." Ephesians 2, 11 to 16, and, and they're just in, incredible verses. But as I thought about those verses, and, and if you've ever done this, if you've ever done a study, you, does your mind ever wander? You, you kind of go different places. And so I, I kept thinking of a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So I know we just read these verses, but, it, but I want you to keep your finger here. Turn a couple books to the left of where we are to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 20 is where we're going to focus. 2 Corinthians 5, and in 2 Corinthians 5, it's just one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. 
And, and there's so many therefores as you read through it, therefores. You know, it, so let me say this based on what I just said. Let me say this based on what I just said. In verse 17, he says, if any person is in Christ, they're what? They're a new creation. We, we are new. We, we're made brand new. Uh, you get to the fact that at the beginning of the chapter, we will all stand before God, every single one of us, and we will give an account to God for, for what we've done with our lives. Now, again, it's not going to be whether or not you get into heaven. Uh, that's already a given. But, it, but it, you get rewarded for that which you've done in your life. Uh, last week, Pastor Kevin, just a great reminder of, of the great command that there is in Christianity. We are to love who? With all our heart. We're, we're to love the Lord with all of our heart and love our neighbor as ourself. Uh, Martin Luther said these are the great commands, which means if we don't do those commands, we've committed the greatest sins, right? So how many of you do well? How many of you have loved God completely this week? Anybody? How about your neighbor? Have you loved your neighbor the way you ought to this week? I mean, again, there are those times when you're just, things happen, stuff occurs, and, and we, we kind of fall short. And one day we're standing before the Lord and understand that he's given us a decision to make. Will we love him or will we love others? When you think about Christianity, it's very positive, isn't it? We tend to think of Christianity as being a negative thing. Don't do this, don't do this. But it's very positive. Love the Lord, positive, right? Love your neighbor, that's a positive thing. You know, that's what we are called to. To do. And so in this chapter, Paul is talking about the fact that you're a new creation. You're going to stand before God. Again, not whether or not you get into heaven, you're already there. But the rewards that come. And then in verse 20, if you don't have this verse underlined in your Bible, if you do underline, it's a verse worth underlining. Verse 20. It says, therefore. In order to get that therefore, you've got to read through the whole prior part of the chapter, which we're not going to do. But therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now so think about that. You and I represent the Lord. Think about his choosing of us. We've talked about this before in other contexts. When you choose an ambassador, what do you normally pick? You know, people who are polished and, and smart and intelligent and, and, and you know, perhaps some, some class to them. But you look at the church, and Paul said to the Corinthians, that we are foolish and just, you know, I mean, when was the last time you looked in the mirror at you? You know, I would not have picked me as an ambassador, but he picked me. And he picked you. We are ambassadors for Christ. And then look at the rest of the verse. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. It's as though God is speaking through you and me with a bullhorn, saying, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You think about the, the protests that are taking place, the people with the bullhorns, and then they had the slogans. And Paul is saying to you and me, you're a Christian. Take your bullhorn and, and say to people, you need to be reconciled to God. You need to come to him. But understand that, that there's this reconciliation to God, but there's also a second reconciliation. And that's a reconciliation to people. Because we become part of what is called the church. The called out ones of Jesus Christ. So you go back to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2. You and I are to be reconciled to God, we're to be reconciled to others. That's what we are called to do. And the first two verses of this section, uh, Paul speaks bluntly to the Gentile Christians to remind them of the difference between them and the Jews. Now again, second generation Christians, they may not realize that. But, but to understand in that day, the, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles was every bit as stark as any other prejudice you can think of in your lifetime. So in verses 1 and 2, or excuse me, 11 and 12, I, I call it the divided group. The divided group. And Paul wants to focus on a divided group. But notice if you would, the beginning of verse 11. Do you see the word? The word is, how many are you looking? You're, you're looking at me. You're looking at me. Look at the verse. Verse 11. Therefore, or also, or to. What he's doing is he's referring backwards. And what he's referring backwards to is to verse 1. And from verses 1 to 7, Paul uses lousy English grammar. It's terrible English grammar. Because verses 1 to 7 is one sentence. Imagine trying to say that one sentence in one breath. You know, it, but it was, it's like Paul got going, I can't stop. And in verses 1 to 7, he's talking about the fact that all are lost. All are lost without Christ. But then, in verses 8 to 10, he said, all are found the same way. And that's through the grace of Jesus Christ. So every person on earth, Jew, Gentile, male, female, no matter who you are, you're lost apart from Christ. But the only way you're going to be found is the same way. And that's through the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, he reminds the Gentiles that they were a divided group when it comes to the good news of the gospel. Specifically, note in the outlines that they were derided. They were derided. In verse 11, look again if you would. And let me read it the way that, that it kind of would come across. It is therefore remember, again, verse 11, that formerly you 
And the word the is in there. Sometimes the Greek language doesn't have, but it's in there. It's almost like capital letters. The Gentiles. And to the Jews, they would talk about the Gentiles. Like you would talk about whoever it is you're prejudiced against. You know, those people. That's the way the Jews regarded the Gentiles. Then their, their heritage by way of descent was in the flesh. And in fact, if you look at verse 11 again, therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, and then who are called uncircumcision. And you think about any derogatory term you can think for any person, and that's what was said of the Jews and the Gentiles. In fact, they would go so far as to say that the Gentiles were dogs. That's how they regarded the Gentiles. And, and so the Gentiles, they're, they're this derided group by the Jews. I, and so Paul goes on to say, as you note in the outline, uh, that in several ways you were separated. And, and you got to remember this, that you were separated. So look again, if you would, at verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, stranger to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Uh, if we're going to really diagram it, there, there are five things there, but I just want to emphasize a couple of them. First, is that they were Christless. They were Christless. Remember that the gospel was to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But secondly, Paul says, verse 12, that you were aliens. Uh, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and all the blessings the Jews possessed. And he amplifies this, again, if you look at verse 12, by saying you were strangers. You were strangers to the promises that came to the Jews. They had this foundation of the, the Messiah to come. The Gentiles had no idea of all this. You were strangers to all of that. And then he says, and probably the words that, that are the most powerful, poignant, and hardest to, to reconcile, is that they were hopeless. They were hopeless. Look again at verse 12. Remember, that at that time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope. Having no hope. And obviously without God in the world. Uh, you think about hope. I, I've shared this so many times. That a gazillion years ago, a, a psychology for professor at Harvard University said the greatest word in the English language is hope. And how many times have you said, is there any hope? You get a diagnosis. Is there any hope? You, you hear of a, a, of a family member and, and there's, there, there's been a separation. Is there any hope? Is there any hope for our marriage? Is there, any, is there any hope? But imagine living your life without hope in a sense that, that I have no hope not only now, but also for the life to come. There's no hope to, in this life and in the one that will come after. In 1899, I believe it was, I think I had the year right, two men died the same, at the same year. One was D.L. Moody. How many of you have heard of D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody. And again, if you know the story, D.L. Moody, uh, December 23rd, he's on his deathbed, and he talked about things that he saw. And his son said, Dad, you're dreaming. He goes, this is no dream. You know, he was seeing heaven. He, he was seeing the glory of the Lord. He had said earlier that year, and if you've heard Pastor Jay tell it, I should have him tell it right now. He can do it from memory. You know, have him tell that you know, one day you'll hear that D.L. Moody has died, but don't believe a word of it. Don't believe a word of it, because I've just gone higher to another place. But the same year, another man died. He was an atheist. And you can look him up after the service. His name was Robert Ingersoll. And Robert Ingersoll, Ingersoll died as an atheist. And at his service, there was no singing, there was no celebration. There was no joy. Because as an atheist, what do you hope in? You just hope in this world. In fact, when he died, they, they wouldn't remove the body from the home. Because his wife just, she couldn't let him go. And, and they finally had to remove the body because it's kind of gross, but the body was just beginning to smell and it was just a health hazard. But how do you let go of somebody when there's no hope? It's all you have. And so for the Gentiles, Paul says... You need to understand, you were Christless. Uh, you were aliens. You were strangers. You were without hope. That's who you were. And you need to understand that as you get to the next point in the outline. And here's the next point. is the uniting factor. The uniting factor. Look if you would at verses 13 to 14. In these words, but now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. It, verse 13 begins with the words, but now. And it's contrasting with what was. You know, you were separate, right? But now 
You've been brought near uh, because of the blood of Christ. If you look back at verse 4, it uses the words, but God. You know, kind of that same construction, but God. You were lost, but God, he saved you. He, he gave you grace. He gave you redemption. So you were separate, but guess what? But now, and then you get to the outline. Uh, here's how Paul describes what happened next. You were brought near by the blood of Christ. You were brought near by the blood of Christ. And look if you can, again, if you would, at verse 13, how he describes. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off. You're far off. You, you were excluded. You're on the outside. I, I think back to you know, elementary school. I remember if you remember those days, some of you, you know, with great pain, when they picked sides for teams. Remember? You know, picking sides for teams. And <clears throat> were you ever the one who was far off? You know, kind of the one who's out there, and it's like, uh, okay, if we've got to take down. You know, kind of. And, and Paul's just, it's, you were far off. Uh, you are strange. There, there's no way, but because of the blood of Christ, there was nothing that they could do or manufacture to come near to God. If it was to occur, it had to be because of God. God is the one who had to do it. And, and so exactly what the sacrifice of Jesus brought about, it provided a means whereby people can be brought near to God, but then understand, being brought near to God, we're brought near to one another. We become part of, of these called out ones who are called the church. And got to keep in mind, uh, it's only through the blood of Christ that salvation can come. That's the only way that salvation comes, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and all who come into the church come in exactly the same way. So it doesn't matter if somebody was rich or powerful or celebrity. If, if they come to faith in Jesus Christ, guess what? They came the same way you did. There's no difference. Uh, there's no advantage. We all come the same way because it's through his blood. But then notice, if you would, in the outline, that we're given peace by the God of peace. In verse 14, uh, note the word peace. It says, for he himself is our peace. He's our peace. Uh, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now look at verse 15. And again, notice the word peace, the last uh, word in the verse. By abolishing his flesh, the enmity which is a law of commandments contained in ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And what you find in verse 14, uh, we see that he is our peace. And at the end of verse 15, it states that he made peace. And I think of, of a picture. You know, when I go home, I, I, I cross the big bridge on Brig Street. I, I cross the bridge. And all I can think of is this picture of God is our peace. He's the bridge. And he takes us into, the, into this land of peace. And everybody who's there has come the same way. We, we all enter because of the peace who is Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did is stated in the next point. It said he made one through the broken wall. He made one through the broken wall. Look again if you would at verse 14. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Sometimes uh, look up and you can find it pretty easily, just the, the Jewish temple. In a Jewish temple, uh, the very first part you walked into was the court of the Gentiles. It, it was the court of the Gentiles. That's where the Gentiles could come. But emblazoned on the wall, very, very clearly, and they have found the inscription that's there. Uh, here's what it says. is no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Welcoming, isn't it? You know, but you think about, you had the, the court of the Gentiles, then you had the court of the women, then you, you, you go on from there. Jewish women, obviously not. And then you go on from there. But, but what Jesus did, he broke the wall. He broke the barrier. He, he, he took that which separated Jew and Gentile, and, and he said, it is no more. Because now in me there is one new man. And, and you think about the same image when Jesus died. Remember what happened to the veil? What happened to the veil? The, the veil was rent. And you know what that symbolized? That there's now no longer any separation between people and God. And, and so now we have this, this unity that comes because of what Jesus did with him and with one another because of his work on the cross. Uh, sometime, I just would encourage you if you haven't studied it in a while, go back to 1938. 1938, uh, Britain was on the verge of war with uh, Germany and having gone through World War I. If you read the accounts, people were just... I mean, the, the, the magnitude of just the, the palpable fear. 
And in 1938, Hitler wanted to take over Czechoslovakia. And he was going to go to war to do it. Neville Chamberlain, how many of you remember Neville Chamberlain? Those of you, Neville Chamberlain. Yeah, he was the prime minister. He went and, and he got a peace accord with Adolf Hitler. And he came back and he said, we have peace in our time. And Neville Chamberlain, if you read the accounts, I mean, he went through London. You would have thought there was a wedding. He was, I mean, people were cheering. He, he stood with the king and queen on the balcony and just this, this adulation. Oh, peace in our time. This is great. Until September 1st, 1939. Just a year later when Hitler invaded Poland and that began World War II. And, and you think about it. How can you have lasting peace in our time apart from Jesus Christ? You can't have it. You may get along with somebody for a while, but it's only through Jesus that that lasting peace is possible both now and into eternity. Well, we are to be reconciled to God, be reconciled to others, and there's a new result. Verses 15 and 16. They're just great verses. Look if you would. Verses 15 and 16. It is by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, and focus that word, the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And notice if you would the word enmity, verse 15. It's speaking of the enmity between Jews and Gentiles. And what, and what Jesus did was he broke that enmity. It, now there, there can be unity between Jews and Gentiles. You think about Galatians 3.28. There's no longer Jew nor Gentile. There's no longer male nor female. There's no longer slave or free. Again, we had that identity, but at the cross we are all equals because of the work of Jesus Christ. In verse 16, it speaks of the enmity between sinners and God. And, and the, the new result then is what you find in the outline. And it's this that the two are made into one. The two are made into one. Look if you would at verse 15. Most Bible translations state the following, that in himself he might make the two into one new man. But the word make that's used there is a very distinct Greek word. And it means to create. It means to create. And it offers this incredible picture of God taking Jews and Gentiles and put any type of uh, division in terms of people you want taking any people and bringing them together, and it's no longer Jew nor Gentile, it's no longer male nor female, it is now the church. It's now those who belong to Jesus Christ. I was thinking about colors, and I asked Carol Cooley, who's an artist, and I said, uh, when you take, you take red, you put blue, you put them together. What does it create? Purple. It creates purple. But so purple comes out of two distinct colors, right? Red, blue, together purple. You take uh, red and yellow, and you get what? Orange. Again, red, yellow, bring them together, you get orange. So, so two distinct colors, but now they're a new color. It's a new color, and that's exactly what Jesus did with us. He took you and me. Uh, he took you know, Jews. Gen he took every single person on the face of the earth who belongs to him, and he created a new person, and we are now the church. Well, you go along. The, the next thought so we are reconciled into one body. Reconciled into one body. And reconciled means to bring together again. And they thought about the story of the prodigal son. You know, the son who leaves, but then he comes back. And he's reconciled to his father. And I thought of that on two images. One is a reconciliation on a human basis. But the, the parable, the story, is really illustrating the fact that with God, we now can be reconciled. That we're now one new person because of the work of Jesus Christ. So it was Peter who defended the ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles. And I want you to turn, if you would, to Acts 15. Acts 15. Again, just a couple of books to the left of where we are. Acts chapter 15. Again, understand, the gospel went to Jews first. And then it began to go to Gentiles. And how many of you know that some of the Jews did not like that? Kind of like, wait a minute, those people are dogs. Are you, are you kidding me? And they're getting the, the gospel. And, and what is going on here? And again, you think about any type of prejudice you want, whether it's white, black, male, female, it's just now the gospel has gone into that group. And, and so in Acts 15, they, they gather all the leaders of the church together. So we're going to talk about this. How are we going to handle this? This is a new thing for us. So what are we going to do with it? I remember the Jews thought they were it. They're the chosen ones. We're God's nation. We are the promises of God. And these people are dogs. And so, so what in the world is going on? And so Peter, 
Uh, in Acts 15, beginning with verse 8, he says the following, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. Notice that? They get the same spirit that we got. Same exact thing. Verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? I mean, think about it. You haven't been able to live up to all the, the truths of the gospel either. But now we have grace. And then it's great verse in verse 11. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. And in this phrase, in the same way as they also are. It's no different. Jews and Gentiles, anyone who's lost comes to the Savior in the very same way. And then in verse uh, 12, all the multitude kept silent. It's like, what do we say to that? We're all saved the same way and brought to unity because of the work of Jesus Christ. Both Gentile and Jew needed to acknowledge their sin and a need for a Savior. And so doing, they were reconciled into one body. Warren Wiersbe, uh, whose commentaries I, I enjoy immensely, but as a pastor, just stuff, he said he had, had a man come in to him and said, you know, Pastor Wiersbe, I, I, I need your help. My wife and I, we're having problems. We need a recancellation. <laughs> and whereas we thought, hmm, I think he means reconciliation. But, but he thought about the word recancellation. And as he wrote about this, he thought, it, it's just a great word. Uh, that God canceled our sin against him, right? That's what Colossians 2 says. And in so doing, we're to cancel our grievances against others. And to be brought together again. So who do you have a grievance against? You know, who are you prejudiced against? Uh, it, people are created in the image of God, and as part of his church, we are made one because of the unifying work of Jesus Christ. Well, I find as I get older, I say this all the time in communion, but more and more, just forgetting things, forgetting stuff. And so you're called in Scripture over and over again, remember, remember. So there are three things I want us to remember, and they're in the outline is this. Here's the first one. Remember that at the cross, all are equal. At the cross, all are equal. Uh, we retain our heritage, our human identity, but at the cross, we are made a new creation and given a new, new identity. Now, instead of boasting of the fact that I'm an American, I'm to boast of the fact that I'm a Christian. I belong to Jesus Christ. Now, I've got to tell you, I'm proud of my heritage. I, I, I am proud of who I am, but I don't want to boast in that because that's nothing compared to the fact that I belong to Jesus Christ. And that's what you and I need to remember if we belong to him. Here's the second thing. Remember, at the cross, all experience the same benefits. At the cross, all experience the same benefits. None of us is better than the other. We've all been given the same privileges because of the Lord. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, you, you were more special than me or vice versa. Uh, we all came exactly the same way because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And then third, remember at the cross, there was only new creations. And I know the grammar there is not really good. Um, but there's only new creations not division based on anything. The Bible does identify that one day we'll be gathered people from every tribe and nation and tongue. So, so there's a distinguishing you know, of our heritage, of our identity. But, but as a church, as God's people, what identifies us more than anything else is that we're united in the church because of Jesus Christ. And if we're a new creation, we've been united with all others who are also new creations in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have difficulty in loving other people? Any difficulty? Thank you for raising your hand, that true confession. Yeah, yeah, just, I mean, and again, uh, you, you see somebody who is dressed a certain way, where does your mind go? Depending upon how they're dressed. You know, you see somebody who's a different skin color, what do you think? See somebody who just is different, how, how do we think? And again, as people, that it's a natural response. But as Christians, we need to understand that people are created in the image of God. Amen? But then secondly, here's what you don't know. is that that person against whom you may be prejudiced uh, may be somebody who's about to become a member of God's family. It might become your brother or your sister in Jesus Christ. And how does that happen? Well, it happens because of what Jesus did on the cross. So on Monday... Um, how many of you know we had a storm that went through? Anybody? 
Anybody? Do you have any amens here? It would just storm and it went through. And it was one of those where if you're listening by tape and you're in Kansas or something, then you're like, what happened? It, well, it just stormed and went through. There were seven tornadoes and power was out to like nine million people or something. At least it seemed that way. Uh, and as it occurred, you know, talking to, to Pastor Kevin, he has a friend who, who worked at Comet. He said, on top of everything else, most of the assessors for storms were all on the East Coast working on the hurricane. So then it meant delays here and all that stuff. And, and so the power went out. So our power went out, and in our neighborhood, our power normally doesn't go off for very long. But it went out, you know, hour number two, now hour number three. Well, in the meantime, across the street from us, we've gotten new neighbors. We've never been able to meet them. They're just kind of dribs and drabs moving in, never got to meet them. But they're out in their driveway, and they're just kind of, they're kind of sitting there. And kind of, it seemed kind of odd. And I had Malachi and you know, the three-year-old, and so I thought, you know, maybe I should go meet the new neighbors. Well, how many of you know when your power's out and you're trying to take care of all that stuff, really the last thing you want to do is meet new neighbors? You know, I just got to be honest with you. I mean, it had nothing against them. It was just, ah, this isn't really what I want to do, but I'll take Malachi and he'll kind of, you know, bridge the gap here. You know, he's so cute. And yes, here we go. Well, to, to add to the story, our, our neighbors are much older than us. They're much older than us. I mean, they are. They're, they're older than us. And they also happen to be of a different color. I, they're a different color. And so here are our neighbors, they're, they're older, different color, I'm coming over, we've never met, now I'm coming over to meet you. And so I go over, I take Malachi, and we go over, and, and we just start talking about where did you move from, and, you know, and just all, all the stuff that you normally do with, with chit-chat. And then she asks the question. She goes, well, what do you do for a living? Which I thought, if you look at my face and the hair, you, you got to ask, are you retired? That's normally the question I get, but I think she just assumed that, you know, what do you do for a living? Now, again, when I was younger, I used to take the safe way out. I used to say, I work with people. You know, true, right? I said, well, I'm a minister. And her eyes lit up. She goes, you are? What church are you a part of? And I told her. And she found out, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> so right away we went from your neighbors across the street, who I don't know, you're older, different color, to... We're brothers and sisters in Christ. So we, we sat there for about 10 minutes just having this praise the Lord, hallelujah time until the three-year-old now who becomes a distraction, we got to get across the street. But it changed, right? The, the bridge that, that, that now, you know, these are not just neighbors. This is a brother and sister in Christ. You know, we belong to the same family. Now, you know, they may go to a different church, but it doesn't matter, does it? Because we're part of one family, united together because of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus did. He's a great unifier. He's the one who broke down the walls. It doesn't make it easy. You know, there are times when we have issues with people that we've got to work through. But he's the one that makes it possible to be united because of the grace given to every single one of us. Let's pray together. Father, with thanksgiving, we gather and we understand <clears throat> that it's by grace that we are saved through faith. It's not as a result of what we have done or who we are. But it's totally because of the work of Jesus Christ. That you are the one who brought unity. You are the great unifier. And so because of what you've done, we can be reconciled to God. But then also, we can be reconciled to others. I think what John said, that if we say that we love you, <clears throat> but hate our neighbor, then we make you a liar. In some ways, it's easy to love you because we go into our closet, we pray. And, but to love our neighbor, to love others. Uh, as Pastor Kevin mentioned last week, it's an act. It's a decision. It's something we choose to do based on your work in our life. And so, Father, I pray that this week, as you give us opportunity, that as we, we see people with whom we might disagree, that, that rather than be angry at them, we would pray for them. Uh, that when possible, we would seek in some way to build bridges to them. But that, Father, more than anything else, we would recognize that in Jesus Christ, there is a possibility of people being united together from every tribe and nation and tongue on the face of the earth. And if we can't rejoice at that, I don't know what we can rejoice at. Governments cannot make people get along. Uh, policies cannot force people uh, to agree with each other. Uh, re-education camps or whatever cannot force people uh, to think differently than what they are in their heart. But you can do that because of what you have done and the way in which you have worked. So Lord, I pray.
Break down the walls that separate us from anyone else. Uh, allow us to remember the veil that was broken in order that we might have unity with you. And most of all, I pray that we rejoice because of the unity we share because of Jesus Christ. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. This is a final thought. Uh, Christians must take the lead in affirming the worth of all. And I thought about this all week long based on, on being people created in the image of God. People, even though they're lost, are still created in the image of God. Uh, and the potential uh, of the fact they might become members of our family. You never know. The neighbor across the street could be a believer. So watch what you're doing. All right? Let's stand as we sing a final song to the Lord.